Hey folks, so for today's video I thought I might just have a bit of a ramble about the state of Linux gaming. I want to cover a few things. I want to cover, of course, the current state of Proton, Valve and Steam. I also want to look at how dependent is the Linux gaming ecosystem on that particular platform and uh, whether or not if for example, Valve and Steam were to disappear tomorrow, what the state of Linux gaming would be like. I also want to talk a little bit about free and open source gaming as well, something that I personally thoroughly enjoy. I want to talk a little bit about some of the business decisions and um, and how important things like market share are. So just a good old ramble for today's video. But before I crack on with that, first off, I want to talk a little bit about my hardware setup. I always feel that that is a particularly um, useful piece of information to know when you're talking about Linux gaming, because I do find that people have vastly different experiences depending on their hardware choices and, of course, their distribution choices at the moment. Now, for my current gaming platform, I'm using uh, Manjaro, uh, a very well-known Linux distribution. And the reason I use that is simply because it gives you reasonably up-to-date software in the repositories. It gives you reasonably up-to-date uh, NVIDIA drivers. Uh, it gives you just generally like a, a reasonably up-to-date version of, for example, OBS that I use for streaming uh, and all that kind of stuff. I could get a very similar experience if I used Ubuntu and then just use lots of PPAs, maybe flat packs here and there. But with Manjaro, it just seems to have this all encapsulated into the core of the distribution itself. And it's just a general preferential choice. Uh, usually one of the markers that I decide uh, which distribution is more suited to me personally is how quickly it takes from the end of installation to setting it up where I feel like it is you know, good to go, as it were. Uh, and there are some distributions that I can set up really, really quickly, Manjaro being one of them. It's just I just type in a few uh, uh, lines in the terminal to install the programs that I need, and I'm pretty much good to go. Uh, there's also Linux Mint for some reason. Uh, it, I would say that that's on a slightly different end of the distribution spectrum when it comes to uh, when it comes to the up-to-dateness of the software. Linux Mint actually tends to have a slower um, uh, velocity in terms of release, I guess is a way you could explain it. But they do focus more on system stability, whereas Manjaro is a little bit more move fast, break things, although not as move fast and break things as, for example, Vanilla Arch or Antiogos or anything like that. So with me, Manjaro is, is a bit of a, a happy medium between uh, having you know, the fully up-to-date software, but having, a, and also a level, a degree of stability. And I have found that uh, with Manjaro. Um, but that's just my personal experiences. I, I know that people have vastly different experiences with vastly, you know, with, with different Linux distributions. So it's all very personal. But yeah, uh, Manjaro is one of those distributions that I can get up and running very sh shortly after installation because, uh, you know, it, it gets me up-to-date software uh, rather quickly and, and as I need it. And it's good for, for gaming in that regards. I find that you can get better performance with the with, with you know with with newer software. It's it really is as simple as that. But with certain circumstances, for example, my laptop, which has a much more regular and shall we say mundane set of use cases when it comes to you know clerical tasks, office tasks, and and printing and things like that, that something like MX Linux uh, is perfectly suited for. It's a nice lightweight distribution that does uh, all of the the basic tasks that you would expect of a laptop. Uh, really, really well with minimal maintenance. So it depends. And uh, I also feel that like when it comes to something like Manjaro or a rolling release, um, sometimes there are a lot of updates to download. And if you don't have a particularly decent internet connection, you know, that can be a problem at times. So lots of things to factor in when it comes to choosing a distribution. There is never a like a universally correct distribution um, that you can choose because they're all suited to the use case. And that is uh, something that I like about Linux. Also, though, that complexity, that idea that there is a different Linux distribution for different use cases, different personalities, that level of customization is something that doesn't work well in the mass market. And I think that it is probably something that does hold Linux back in the mass market, which is one of the reasons I don't think that we should ever really consider the market share of Linux to be any real meaningful indicator. Yes, if the Linux market share was about maybe 10%, then there would be much more incentive to bring over AAA games to the platform and things like that, and uh, and that would be great. But really, does does the you know like once we've hit that sort of degree of of mass, once we've hit that 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 size, uh, there really is not likely you know we're not likely to go sort of beyond that unless we actually make changes to the platform. I think most of us don't want uh, that. Most of us the sort sort of the you know the reason we've chosen Linux is because we want to break away from uh, from the sort of the preset decisions made by by Windows uh, in particular. Also, um, 
hardware. Now, um, I recently, I say recently now, not uh, not too long ago, updated to the Ryzen 7 processor. Now, this isn't the latest version of the Ryzen. It wasn't even the latest version when I got it, or it was sort of coming to the end of its particular cycle. But I wanted something that was a bit more tried and tested. But yeah, AMD Ryzen. I've used AMD for gaming processors now for... I don't know, the best part of 10 years, and I've got to say I'm really happy with it. Um, I've always found that AMD processors work particularly well with Linux. The laptop over here does have an Intel processor, I believe, and it works fine as well. But yeah, uh, I, 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 must ha I, you know, I must say that AMD processors uh, just work particularly wonderfully, and I'm also running a NVIDIA GTX 970, so I'm running a NVIDIA graphics card on an AMD uh, processor and uh, I I get a really great run uh, I get re I have a lot of success with that particular setup that's a particular setup that I would choose again and again and again uh, knowing what I know now and and having the experiences that I have uh, I play a lot of steam games as those of you that follow me on twitch will definitely know and uh, I use proton on a couple of new games I think the two games that I use proton on that are a real testament to its power uh, is hitman 2 the latest Hitman game, absolutely wonderful game, runs pretty much as good as native, um, which is great. Uh, sometimes you have to let the, uh, I think the graphics cache um, build up when you load into a level. Uh, you only ever have to do that once after installation. So that means you get a bit of stuttering on like the first exploration of a given level. Given the state, given the nature of the Hitman 2 game, that is perfectly fine. And uh, it basically, in my personal opinion, would get a, uh, uh, either a, uh, a very high gold or a platinum on the uh, on on the Proton DB, which is the Proton database for how well games run. It's it's a nice little database there. Uh, and there's Kingdom Come Deliverance, which requires a little bit of um, faffing around to set it up just right. But once you've actually got the um, once you've actually done the the significant amount of faffing around that you need to do to get um, Kingdom Come Deliverance working, it runs pretty much as good as native there as well. If you want to know what faffing around uh, I'm particularly referring to, check out ProtonDB. Most of the comments will have the instructions on how to get it up and running. Um, but it doesn't work directly out of the box. I think it gets a gold, if I'm not mistaken, on ProtonDB. Uh, possibly a silver. A silver, I think, might mean that you have to make some changes to get it working, whereas a gold means it runs almost as well as, as native. I, I think, I can't remember, I'm my memory might be failing me here now. But anyway, Kingdom Come Deliverance, pretty much once you've got it set up and running, uh, runs as well as native as well. So those are two very modern games, high fidelity graphics games that uh, run particularly well on, re you know, like this isn't, uh, you know, cutting edge hardware. It's pretty decent hardware. The process is rather nice. Um, but also I don't run a high def screen either. I run a 1440 by 900 monitor. Uh, and it's a monitor that I've had now for like, 12 years, I think, 12, 13, 14 years. Um, and I just can't bring myself to throw out old stuff that is still usable. Um, and, I, and I use it and I, I, you know, it works perfectly well for me. So I, I know that uh, I could, uh, you know, upgrade like an ultra wide monitor or a big fancy uh, HD monitor or something like that. But to be honest, this has just served me so well. And I think generally speaking, as a broader society, we throw out far too much usable stuff. Um, in fact, I've even got a backup monitor that I bought second hand, which is the same resolution of that uh, as this. So even if this monitor were to die tomorrow, I still wouldn't be upgrading to a, to a HD uh, monitor. Um, because I picked it up, I think it was for like eight quid in a car boot sale. We have this is a second hand, this type of second hand sale we have here in the UK. Um, and I yeah, picked it up for eight quid. I wasn't going to say no to it. I didn't even know if it worked at the time. I said, well, eight quid. I took a chance, took it home, tested it. Works wonderfully. So... There we go. So that's my hardware setup. That's just a little bit about my uh, distribution choices. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Proton as well, uh, now that we've had Proton for uh, for a good number of months now. And I've got to say that it is, it really is, I think I still stand by my um, uh, choice of words when I say that it was Christmas come early. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, it allows me to run uh, games that are like old games from my childhood, games that will never even get be considered for being ported across to Linux. Um, and yeah, admittedly, I can use uh, regular old wine. But the great thing that Valve have decided to do when it comes to developing Proton and, and uh, working with DXVK and all this kind of technology that we can use to port Windows games over to Linux is that they've made it open source. They've actually made it so that you can use the technology that they've developed 
in a program like Lutris, for example, and run get GOG games running as well. Because when you uh, so-called buy games on Steam, uh, you don't really buy games on Steam. It's more of a long-term rental. I think uh, we all need to sort of understand that. It, it is outlined in the terms of conditions. I'm sure not many of you have really even considered reading them, to be honest. But they do talk about the fact that there could be a day when their servers go down and that they don't have, you know, the, 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 it, there isn't a recourse to provide you with um, an actual owned copy of the game. So, yeah, with, when it comes to Steam and Valve, you know, there might come a day where Valve um, decide to, to not make games anymore, decide, you know, maybe they go... Um, maybe they go bankrupt or they shut the business down for one reason or another and they are in a position to give you ownership over the games that you've bought but then again I don't know how complicated that is when it comes to uh, the the legal side of things like how uh, publishers on the platform have have you know embedded the steam into the overall game and all that kind of stuff it gets really complicated at that point that's why GOG are quite good in terms of keeping it simple and I know that GOG have not been as good to Linux as Valve and Steam. So this is rather complicated. See, we've got the big corporate monopoly in Valve who actually have treated Linux really, really well, certainly as well as can be expected, beyond as well as can be expected for a company of its size, its position, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and they've open sourced things like Proton um, for the benefit of, of, you know, I think a lot of it is the idea of a rising tide raises all ships. Um, it's that maybe Valve don't see things like GOG and Itch as a serious threat. So by open sourcing um, things like Proton, they actually just make the Linux user base happier, uh, more ingratiated to Valve as a company. Uh, and I think that it's work. I certainly have a more positive feeling of Valve uh, because of their contributions to the community as well. I think that the way that they've behaved for the most part is pretty good. Um, I know that we can level some criticisms at DRM, but hey, they've open source Proton. So if you if you don't like their DRM policies, you can still um, benefit from some of the things that Valve have done by applying the, the you know the Proton technology, the DXVK contributions they made to GOG games and get them running as well. So you know there we go. I think that this is a very good example of a rising tide uh, raises all ships in this regard. So, and I do have a lot of games, like the games that are nearest and dearest to my heart, I do own both on Steam and GOG. And I know that it seems a little bit ridiculous to actually buy maybe two copies of the game, but Steam is very convenient, and it's certainly a company that I don't mind supporting. GOG, for its faults in regards to Linux, they do actually, you know, there is a Linux, you know, they, there is there is some Linux-based stuff on GOG, but their focus is on, on DRM, and... Well, that's um, that's good as well because it gives you true ownership of, of the games. I don't necessarily like the idea that they keep pushing people towards the GOG Galaxy. Uh, I actually really I thought it was a feature that they didn't have a store, you know, that they didn't have a program, a launcher program like Steam, like Itch.io. I like the idea that you would just go on the website and download a game like normally. And I know you can do that now, but if you go and do that, you actually have to go and and, and select download a backup. If you know what I mean, you have to go down and, and it says, uh, back up your games yourself. You know, it's not like, it used to be the case of, hey, download, um, you know, the game and they'll give you an, an executable file and you can run it. Nowadays, they, they really do push the GOG Galaxy and that's been a creeping um, um, direction that they've been pushing you into. And I don't know if they'll ever get rid of the option to actually download your, you know, files as an executable. That seems to be a significant selling point of theirs. But I really do have to be critical and I do have to uh, outline my my dis disappointment that they've been putting the idea that you can d that you don't need GOG Galaxy. You know, they've been pushing that away and they've been saying that if you do want to download your games as, you know, an owner, that that is considered a backup, a secondary option. So it's maybe a, you know, maybe it's a minor gripe. Maybe I'm making something out of nothing. But I do have to say that the idea that they just seem to be falling in terms of mainstream thinking when the thing that made me appeal to them was that they were a step away, that they said, ah, we're not going to have something just because everyone else has something. We're going to decidedly step away and think for ourselves. And I, I genuinely like people and companies that think like that, that don't um, 
that don't adopt things because other companies and other people are adopting them. People that, you know, I, I like people that step away from the crowd. I don't like, you know, just this idea of blindly following the um, the trends and, and the patterns that people seem to, to fall into. And that was one of the things that I really liked about GOG. And I could even overlook their... Um, them not being particularly interested in, in Linux. They they only pay a lip service to it. Fine, fine. I mean, most of their games work wonderfully on Wine, um, e- even before Proton. You know, that's great. It's a, it's a Wine platform, right? You're still supporting the developers. Um, you're still running the games. You're still playing the games yourself. And the translation layer between the two uh, is, is open source. So, you know, ultimately... That's fine with me. That's fine with me. I know that we all have our individual um, thoughts and and uh, sort of approaches to this. So I'm just sort of going through mine. But there is certainly no wrong or right way to approach this. Um, and we all sort of, you know, reconcile this with ourselves. Now, when it does come to buying uh, games natively brought out for Linux, I do try and have a strong preference for native Linux games. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is because, depend, and this depends on the company, it depends on their budget, it depends on even the game in question, but it's not really economically viable in a lot of circumstances to bring out games natively for Linux. Um, it, it's when it comes to like you know all the weighing up the 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 money side of things, looking at games as a business. Um, bringing out things for Linux isn't always like, it's not like a guaranteed profit, like, because when you bring out a game for Linux, you have to provide the support and, um, and all of the, you know, the, the assistance that goes with, uh, distributing a game on a platform. But, uh, at the end of the day, you could just, ha- but you, you know, you could be providing a, a significant amount of support for a very small number of sales. Uh, and we do hear about development uh, developers and publishers saying, well, you know, l- only 0.5% of a uh, 0.5% of our sales go to Linux, but they provide, you know, like 20% of our, our support time. And that is, you know, that's a problem. That's something that's not great. And that's something that things like Proton might be able to assist with. That's things that, um, that, uh, and, and, but specifically, uh, you know, that is something of a, of a, can, that can be something of a concern. And so when a studio, when a publisher, when a developer decides to bring game to Linux, to me, it says that, they have a genuine degree of pride in their work that this isn't just about money this is about to them maybe it's you know like an art form or it's a passion or it's a like a deeper desire to diversify the gaming ecosystem on a technological level there is something more to it than just turning a quick buck and to me i want to see more of that i want to support that whenever i can and and to me it just speaks of sincerity now that's not all the time like i have my suspicions when the first hitman game not the first hitman game hitman tm hitman 2016 came out for linux my gut told me that they brought it out for linux to try and possibly garner a few sales because the game wasn't necessarily necessarily selling as well as they'd hoped because it was it was sort of on a down downward uh a downward trajectory after hitman absolution now hitman 2016 turned out to be an absolutely amazing game and even the uh, sequel to that hitman 2 which is actually the second hitman 2 game i know it's a bit weird they can't name games to save their life um but yeah um and and hitman 2 as well absolutely amazing game wasn't as as this uh, uh time of recording has not been natively launched for linux despite the fact that its sales have not been particularly good but my cynicism the cynical side of me says that they made hitman 2016 uh, Linux. Uh, they brought out a Linux native port and a good Linux native port as well. Like that was, that was a they, a good port of a game to Linux. But uh, the cynic in me says that they did that to maybe garner a few more sales because it didn't look like the franchise was in its healthiest place. Now the release uh, Hitman for Linux was brought out. I believe it was nine months after its Windows release. Um, so it's not be it's not too late now to actually see. Uh, Lin- uh, to see Hitman 2 being brought out for Linux, but um, who knows? Who knows what these companies are thinking? Um, Hitman 2 is now uh, published by Warner Brothers, whereas Hitman 2016 was published by Square Enix, so I don't know if that comes into play here. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe IO Interactive have much more creative control. Um, 
and it's like they they say that they do. Uh, I personally, but this is just my two cents. That's probably worth less than two cents. Uh, would much prefer to have seen IO Interactive have gone completely independent and published it themselves. Uh, there, there, there was obviously a case back in the day when you needed a, a big publisher to actually get the discs out there and to, you know, when there was a much more manuf- much more of a manufacturing process. But nowadays, you can just pop a game up onto Steam and that's where the bulk of your sales are likely to come from. And I certainly think that IO Interactive would have no problem achieving that particular goal. But So, I don't know. I Personally, I think that the role that Warner Brothers and Square Enix have played in the Hitman games have been... Uh, not necessarily particularly worth the money that they get out of it. But that's just me, and, and I, I could very well be ignorant to many factors in that uh, situation. For example, Warner Brothers might have um, brought in a, a big marketing team to garner the sales that they did, despite the fact that for some reason Hitman 2 isn't selling as well as it should. So, may I, you know, maybe Warner Brothers aren't pulling their weight. Maybe they didn't do as good a job as they promised or hoped or anything like that. Anyway, sorry, that's a bit of a tangent. <laughs> and a bit of a rant at Warner Brothers because they're a pretty terrible company if I'm honest but anyway um, but yeah but for the most part uh, Linux you know when a game is brought out natively for Linux to me it is a sincere uh, deg- you know it demonstrates a sincere degree of pride and love for the craft that the developers are working towards and that to me is definitely something that I really 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 want to support and that's why I do put Linux native games preferentially above Proton. Um, But I do have a few rules when it comes to... First of all, I have no problem running Proton on older games because, like I said earlier, they're not going to be... There is a almost zero chance they'll be ported across to Linux natively. And at the end of the day, you're still supporting the developers of the game. You're still, you know, uh, supporting the game itself. And... um, the translation layer is open source. I mean, really, what what more could you ask for in this overall equation? I mean, I've got to say, I you know f- feel a very strong degree of gratitude to the entire to the situation that we're in. That it is now so easy and because even at the best of times before Proton, Valve took a little bit of uh, not Valve, uh, Wine took a little bit of technical knowledge to really get your head around. It wasn't as super straightforward. Yes, there was Lutris. Yes, there was Play on Linux, and yes, those are really good. Um, platforms to actually get games running but you're still required you know like a, a degree of, of of brain power was still really required when it comes to when it comes to actually getting the games running proton made this a click and play experience and and that they should be greatly greatly commended on just for the the, the user interface and the usability of it all i definitely have to uh, have to 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 be incredibly um thankful for to be honest so uh, also because we now live in the situation where Proton is really quite good and it's getting better on each new release and there are regular new releases so it's not like Valve just uh, you know just just chuck something out the door and hope for the best I mean they seem to be sticking with this and um, and and um, when it comes to you know looking at, at, at all, all the games we, we've got thousands of games now available on Linux, right? If if no other new games come to Linux, I would still be I, there would still be more games than I could ever play, even games that I like. So let's get rid of some of the games that I'm not particularly interested in, the cookie clickers, maybe some of the graphic novels. Um, you know, so so, so those just aren't, aren't aren't particularly my style of games anyway. Um, there might be a few other genres in there that I'm not particularly interested, in, but you get, you know, but at the end of the day, right? Native Linux games, there are plenty there that will keep me entertained probably for the rest of my life right and that's not even counting the wine games and i you know and 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 all that kind of stuff as well that that can run outside of of proton but when it comes to new releases and proton if there is a game that i really 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 want to play i'll be honest i'm happy to break the rule i'm happy to break the rule on this one i don't i don't think that my rules in regards to um, any of this are going to be massively hard and, and fast in this regard. Uh, and, you know, and, and I encourage you guys to sort of, you know, work this out for yourself as well and, and, and what Linux means to you and what the diversity of the gaming ecosystem means to you. You know, it, it, it's a personal journey for all of us. So, uh, d- you know, don't think that I'm in any way close to being an authority on any of these opinions that I'm expressing today. This is just a bit of a cathartic ramble about the state of gaming. Um, and, 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 it, and it comes from a place of joy, if I'm completely honest. I'm making this video because I'm really happy with the state of gaming in Linux. But 
if there's a new game, and, and a, a good example is Kingdom Come Deliverance. It's a new game. Um, now, it, as I understand it, I haven't followed the development of Kingdom Come Deliverance particularly closely, but it's one of those games that was intended to come out for Linux and then was pulled. Um, and that is disappointing whenever that happens, especially, you know, it, it's... You can you can sort of it's it's not too bad when a, a game is like it's it's not promised for Linux and it doesn't come out for Linux. Like, you know you know the score with that one, but it's when they they say that they're going to try and bring out a game for Linux and then they sort of turn tail and decide not to that it's too much like hard work or it's not necessarily profitable or whatever, which is fine. Like I'm not having I'm not having a go at those particular decisions, but it's uh, but there are certainly a lot of developers in in the Windows space that are looking to come across to Linux that do tend to bite off more than they can chew. And what really does does annoy me is when um, games that are trying to get funded with Kickstarter make these promises that they'll bring it out for Linux and then decide that they can't do it later on down the line once you know money's been collected. And I will say this right here and right now. If you are a Linux gamer, which I presume most of you are, um, don't I don't give money to Kickstarter projects based on that promise. Least of all if it's a stretch goal, um, because we've just been burnt too many times. I've never done it for the sole reason that, like, even from the off, even when when uh, this Kickstarter for you know Kickstarter for games was a new thing, uh, you know we've seen it time and time again right from the off that it, these are not necessarily lies or deceptions. They're they're well intentioned promises that just can't come to fruition and it's very disappointing and it's very heartbreaking and it's a case of like the best intentions uh can still you know the, what's the expression the road to hell is paved with good intentions like good intentions you know good as they may be can still actually end up being rather disappointing and um uh, and that's a shame in a lot of ways it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a real shame um but you know, and and maybe there are potential ex ex you know exemption cases. For example, if they bring out a demo that's you know reasonably um de you know like reasonably representative of what a final game might look like, um then uh, but then again, like I can't even imagine donating to a Kickstarter game based entirely on promises. Like if they've got like a uh, like an engine going and they've got like a basic like a level to d demonstrate to you then that's one thing and i think really like uh, that's one thing more, more to do with early access then at that that um in that case a good example is iron maiden ion maiden which is a so shall we say a reimagining of the old duke nukem franchise or a parody perhaps might be a, a better way of, of looking at it uh, and it uses the old style graphics but they've updated the control scheme it's an absolutely wonderful game to play and i believe it is still in early access but there are several levels that you can you can actually still you know probably get your teeth into it and i did go ahead and buy that game even though it's not completed because there is something to show you like it's not entirely good intentioned promises this is you know this is something that they can actually demonstrate and bring to your door so and even if to be honest the development of iron maiden stops at this particular level i still feel like i've gotten at least something really tangible and enjoyable out of my money and i think um and i, I know that hex dsl really likes it as well he's done a few videos on iron maiden so definitely check those out if you want to see a good uh, demonstration of the game there and that's a good example of you know the what i like to see in linux gaming as well um and it's a good example. So yeah, definitely, definitely worth checking out the game, even if it's just like checking out Hex's video on it, because it's definitely uh, worth a look. So, uh, but yeah, when it comes to Proton, I I will definitely try and 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 I do definitely try and look to Linux native games. In fact, on my Steam store, I've even selected uh, all of the filters and whatever just to show Linux games. Uh, and then if, if there is something that comes across, uh, you know, my YouTube feed or something like that, that is Windows only. So I'm not even uh, necessarily exposed to that many Windows games. And that's one of the things that I find actually helps uh, when it comes to being a Linux gamer is that, uh, it, you know, it, it, most of the games on my recommended feeds are on Steam and Valve uh, on Steam and all that. They, they are Linux, like I have selected only show me li uh, Linux and Steam OS games. And... Uh, I still got plenty of choice there, but it's not just interwoven with things like, oh, here's a here's um 
an offering of something that you're not really going to buy. So it definitely does tidy up my feed in that regard. But yeah, if there is, you know, if there is a, a you know, a, a video gaming YouTuber who plays a, a Windows only game and I'm like, oh, I want a piece of that, then I will look into Proton. I will break my rule there. But, um, but I'll try and keep it as rare as possible because the genuine care and sincerity and enthusiasm and values of, of uh, developers that actually uh, bring out games for Linux natively uh, definitely, I, I would say, deserve our support more than those that, that don't. Um, and it's uh, uh, what I would like to see going f in the future is like I don't even on a technical level I don't actually have a problem with it like there could be a case maybe in 10 years time where if you just wanted to bring out a game you would bring it out you would make it for Windows and then you would just um, package it or wrap it in like a wine proton wrapper and support it so you would make the game with that in mind so you'd maybe use the Vulcan um, you know graphics uh, set and, and you would use um, you wouldn't use the DRM that doesn't work particularly well with Linux and all that kind of stuff. Like you would use, you you know, you would use uh, cross-platform friendly technologies. You would then bring it out for for Windows and then just port it across from there using something like Proton, using something like Wine. It has been done before and s with varying degrees of success. I'll be completely honest, but these you know this these are pre-Proton days, of course, and. Um, but yeah, and, and if developers and publishers were happy to use Proton and support the game through Proton and test the game through Proton, I would consider that almost as good as native in a lot of ways. However, it then does come to one of the big criticisms of Proton, of Valve, and that is, you know, is Linux gaming dependent on it? Well, I have talked earlier in this video about Valve open sourcing the Proton technology, so not necessarily and i think that to be fair there is a there is something to be said that pc gaming as a whole is more dependent on valve than we perhaps would like to admit so i don't think this is necessarily just a linux thing i think that this could quite possibly be a um a, a pc gaming thing in a in a wider capacity as well uh, oh, okay, my lighting is going... The sun has moved, so I'm just going to adjust my lighting a second. But yeah, I think that PC gaming in general is probably a little bit more dependent on Valve and Steam than we would all like to admit. And I think that if if PC gamers as a wider variety wanted to care more about the diversity of, of, um, of the gaming ecosystem on a technological level, even if you were a Windows gamer and weren't really ready to move over to Linux or weren't interested in moving over to Linux... There is still something to be said about buying games on other platforms, GOG, and also, of course, Itch as well. And again, I don't think we should necessarily diversify for the same reasons that I think we should diversify away from, from, for example, Google services that get their claws into every avenue of the internet. I think that Valve is a, a good company. I think that that they they you know they're not perfect but what company is perfect i think that they're about as good as a company as you can genuinely expect they've been nothing but kind to linux gamers as, as far as i'm concerned and you know they've of course got to 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 you know be a business they've still got to turn a profit they've still got to keep publishers and gaming uh, developers and all that crew happy as well you know there's a lot of people to balance in this equation so so to 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 sit on the sidelines and just make demands that Valve is a company for us and that should do everything that we say and we want is, of course, a little bit hubris here because, again, they've got to please uh, a whole plethora of uh, of different people, not just um, consumers at, at the end of it. Of course, we're going to be advocating for ourselves as we should, but um, we also need to understand that we are not the only people in this equation and, um, and that Valve are in a position where they have to kind of keep everyone happy. And, um, you know, they are kind of getting a bit of, uh, you know, and they get regular criticisms from, from all of the various people that they work with. I think that that would just be the nature of business in general. Uh, interesting to see the Epic Store uh, and how the, their business practice of rather than actually trying to outcompete Valve in a sort of a more sincere race, they've decided to go around buying up exclusives and... Um, and, and, and sort of engage in some of the business practices that that, that are quite loathed by the, the gaming community. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I got to admit, like, it, it did look like um, like the Epic Game Store uh, was potentially a, uh, 
uh, a threat. But I think at this stage now, and also you got to bear in mind, people have like um, have games in their Steam library, so those are there. They're in the bank. Like it's not like people are going to start uninstalling the Steam client. So. Uh, Epic Games might be a little bit, you know, they they might be able to get some kind of wedge into the market, but this isn't like a, a browser where it's as easy as switching out one free product for another. This is a whole different kettle of fish. This is, and and it's, and it's difficult enough to have an impact on the browser market, despite the fact that you're competing free product against free product, gratis product against gratis product, to be more specific. And, uh, you know, w I wonder what, like, a paid... Uh, web browser would be like thinking about that. If you were to pay, I don't know, 20 or 30 quid for a web browser, what kind of features would you expect out of that? That would be quite interesting. Um, and, and I'd be interested, yeah, because like we've, you know, there are some products that people have just gotten used to not paying for. And I think that's a little bit of a, a shame and a bit of a reflection on, on society is that a lot of people want stuff for free and they want it now and they want it conveniently. And I think that there is definitely uh, a sense of entitlement against a lot of people. I'm not necessarily making specific, you know, generalization, well, I'm making the ultimate generalization of everybody. But, you know, there is some, uh, some software that people just, uh, and, and some, you know, digital goods, for example, that people feel perfectly comfortable paying for. Uh, and then there are some things that people just feel like they should have for free. And it's interesting because sometimes, for example, the work that goes into building a web browser is, uh, you know, it's just as much work as something that goes into buy, making a game. But people have come uh, come to, to become used to uh, or people have gotten used to getting a web browser as a piece of free software. Uh, and I, again, I'm talking gratis now, but there is still definitely an open source dimension to this. But um, but yeah, with games, like it's something that for the, uh, for, even though there are free gratis games, uh, for the most part of free to play games, I suppose, is the more, you know, usual term for it. Uh, but people have, have become used to, to buying games as well. Um, so it's yeah, I do find that as a bit of an interesting dimension that that um, there are just some things that people have gotten used to not paying for, and therefore actually trying to bring in a paid product into a market is um, is is near impossible. How could you ever you know like charge for a web browser and expect that to get off the ground? It would be interesting. I would I would personally pay you know some money for a web browser. It would have to obviously come with regular updates and and all that kind of stuff. But I don't actually know like what. Uh, I would uh, expect that would go above and beyond. Um, you know, Google, of course, want to hand out their web browser for free because it gives them just that little bit of extra control over the internet. And maybe there'll come a day when, you know, all of online video is being watched through YouTube and, and all of it, web browsing is done through the Google uh, Google Chrome browser and that all of human knowledge is uh, navigated through that one search engine. I mean, how much control over intellectual pro property can Google garner if they haven't already claimed? It's, it is deeply concerned. And we're not even talking about Google Analytics. We're not talking about Google Recapture. We're not talking about Gmail or any of that kind of stuff. Google Fonts. You know, Google have their claws everywhere, and it's absolutely horrifying when you really, when you really get under the hood. It's not just a search engine. It's not just a you know a video sharing platform. There's a there's a lot more to Google's reach than we we sort of consciously take in. So um, yeah, but anyway, interesting thought there. Interesting side thought about the idea that yeah, there is just some things that we've become used to paying for and and um, and and used to having for free. But um, so. When it comes to, so yeah, Valve being a great company, and I will say that, you know, like I say, not perfect, great company, um, but diversity in the marketplace could always be um, an, an improved thing, but the Epic Games Store is going to bring more of the stuff that we don't like. In fact, to me, you know, e Epic Games is sort of the, it, it brings some of the worst practices of what we see in the console gaming world, um, and even in the PC gaming world, and it's just decided to capitalize on those particular uh, traits rather than actually sincerely be a better product. And a good antithesis to this, of course, is Itch.io. Now, Itch.io, or itch.io, has an open source client. Uh, now, it is based on Electron, but, as I always say, Electron isn't a complete, you know, like, it's not... It can't necessarily, like an Electron app, can't necessarily be judged in its entirety based on whether or not it's an Electron app. Itch.io do a great job even though it's an Electron app. Like, it's a really good to use app. It works really well cross-platform. And um, it, not only is it available in um, 
yeah, like, I mean, it's, it's available as a deb and RPM. And I think even as an executable binary, I think that if you're running something like Arch and you don't want to go into the AUR, um, then you can definitely uh, use the binary that they distribute as well. So there's a lot of options to actually get the Itch.io uh, client, which is great. Also, you can download their games as an actual download. You don't have to go into, it's not like a labeled as a backup type of thing like it is in the GOG store, like uh, Itch.io say, you can download the client if you want to, or you could just download the outright game. So even if you're on a Linux distribution where Either you don't want to run the client or you can't run the client for whatever reason. You can still download and run the games and they make it practically just as easy. And they don't consider it to be like a, a, a second class way of doing things. Um, Itch.io is the platform that gets pretty much everything right except that it just doesn't manage to pull in the, uh, the, the publishers, which is a real, real shame. It's a real shame. Uh, and I think that it goes back to like, you know, why content you know, why content creators like myself publish on YouTube uh, and, and why we put so much stock into YouTube and why gaming publishers put so much stock into things like Steam is because it's not because of the technological merits of the platform. Yes, there are some great technological merits to, uh, to, to YouTube as well. I can upload countless amounts of videos for free. It's amazing. Um, but you know, Peertube can take a lot of the burden. BitChute can take a lot of the burden. But the thing is, YouTube offers discoverability. It, uh, more people will watch my content on YouTube than any other, than all other platforms combined. Uh, and that is something that speaks for itself. And and I wouldn't be surprised if I brought out, you know, if a game was brought out on Steam and maybe it was brought out on GOG and maybe it was even brought out on Itch. I think Long Live the Queen might be such a game that's brought out on all three of those platforms. But I wouldn't be surprised if Long Live the Queen, for example, made more sales on, on Steam than it than any other platform coming close to it. It would just be completely uh, what very, uh, what, you know, very one-sided in terms of that particular competition. So it's discoverability is the thing that I think really uh, is the selling point when it comes to Steam, when it comes to other big platforms like YouTube and that kind of stuff as well. So, um, so I think that is definitely worth considering. Um, but uh, yeah, it's your wonderful client. Um, I'm probably not going to talk about it in this video, not nearly as much as I'm going to talk about Steam and Valve, but it definitely deserves that kind of um, discussion, to be honest. So if Valve and Steam were to disappear tomorrow, I would still be a happy gamer. But I don't know if everyone... Like, I don't know if that would necessarily apply to everyone. Yeah, I'd be pretty I'd be pretty annoyed, to say the least, if my Steam library disappeared. And I would lose a lot of games that were only brought out on on Steam. And that would be a that would be a real shame. I would be I would be very, very, very disappointed. That's a bit of an understatement if I'm completely honest. But I'd be very, very disappointed if that were the case. Um but, but life goes on. Like, I choose Linux before I choose the games. And I think that's a really important distinction to make, is that to me, the integrity of the platform, to me, the integrity of Linux. I've been a Linux user uh, and having Linux as my main operating system since 2006. And I first tried it in 1997. So I've been here for a while, even though I'm not necessarily hugely technically technically adept, like you might find with other uh, Linux users and developers and so forth. Uh, I'm definitely, you know, settled into the platform. And, and I and I definitely, you know, uh, really appreciate what the Linux ecosystem of, uh, or the GNU slash uh, Linux ecosystem of distributions can offer me. And I've I, I literally have zero interest in, in what goes on in the Windows platform. Like I'm so far removed from it now. I just don't care. That's the thing. It's just, you know, uh, I, I, it's just complete apathy. It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's the monopoly of Microsoft. It, it's been broken. I, I mean, you could say that it might, might have been broken by probably Android, I think, might be the, the biggest uh, attack that uh, Microsoft has had to, in, had to endure. And that's technically a Linux-based operating system. So it's one of those twists of fates, isn't it? It's the be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Yes, Linux took down Microsoft. But um, but all things considered, uh, I, I don't like Android as an operating system. I think that there's a good case to be made that it's worse than Windows, despite it being Linux-based.
I don't know. Like to be to be fair, it depends what angle you look at it. Like something that was brought out on Android could very easily, much more easily, be ported across to GNU slash Linux. Anyway, but then again, we don't seem to be having too much problem in the majority of cases porting across Windows games uh, to Linux as well, especially using the wonderful technology brought to us uh, by Proton as well. And let's not forget that Proton, like this isn't a huge gargantuan project. Like the this is a reasonably small team when you compare it to anything corporate. So, you know, if you could imagine what would happen if we had the kind of corporate money and corporate manpower that would actually... Uh, you know, could could actually get things done, and uh, you know, get things done on a on a more much more widespread uh, scale. Then you know, it it would be uh, it would be a piece of cake. It'd be wonderful. But no, you know, this is a very efficient. This is a very uh, sort of human way of dealing with the problem, even though it's done in the corporate world. Uh, but there really aren't that many people. You know, the, it's not like it's a huge de development team in regards to things like Proton and and Wine and all that. It is a substantial number of people involved. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, but it just goes to show that the 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 mountain is climbable, that that these goals are achievable, and um, uh, and 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 I yeah like it's um, crikey working out whether or not I dislike Android or Windows more. I mean historically I've always had the bigger problem with Windows, but all things considered, and 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 I think in some ways I don't know like is it hard like for me when I um, when my my smartphone broke and I decided that I was going to see how long I could last without a smartphone. Uh, I, I thought that this might be, you know, like how 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 easy is it to get away from the Android operating system versus how easy is it to get away from Windows? And I got to be honest, getting away from my smartphone, so by extension, getting away from the Android operating system, was easy. It was. It was. It was easy. I know that not everyone would find it easy, but to be honest, I just like you know look at people. I look at sort of society at large, and I realize, and I see how dependent that we've become on mobile phones that it, it it I don't like it I really don't like it um and and some of the the national parks here in Wales you do hear a lot of stories about how the emergency services are now being called out more times than ever before because people think that they can climb a mountain using the GPS on their phone and then they start realizing oh no they don't have a signal or oh no it, you know they drop it in a puddle or something like that and then suddenly emergency services have to be called costing thousands and one thousands of pounds to rescue someone who thought that their phone could deal with all their problems this is a common occurrence and it's costing the British taxpayer a lot of money. So um, when I look at things like that and I start realising that this over-dependence on the convenience of technology, it's not the technology itself, like we still have the internet, I can still do everything that a smartphone can do for the most part on a desktop, there are some exceptions like like I can't use Snapchat and WhatsApp I believe, who cares. But um, but for the most part, anything meaningful I can do on a desktop PC. So it's not like I, it's not like a reliance or non-reliance on technology in and of itself. It's the reliance on the convenience of it always being there in our pocket when we think we we need it. And you know, it, it's this readily available uh, repository of information as well that people seem to think that it's made us smarter. And I don't, I don't think it has because we've become so dependent on it. It's like, it's like um, if. You know, it, 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 making things too easy can, you know, it 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 becomes a crutch, and then it, it reduces our our independent in a in a wider capacity, doesn't it? But I suppose that degree of convenience has, in and of itself, become a crutch, and um, and and it's you know, you can look around, you can see people recoil into it when they feel insecure or bored or alone or anything like that, and and that is, you know, I, I think there are better ways to deal with it, and you know, I. I I, w I would be incredibly naive to say that, that any of us aren't dependent on technology. I mean, I've had appendicitis, so I, my life has literally been saved by medical technology. And that's just a very, you know, sort of straightforward example. Uh, I'm sure many of you guys watching this video have also had appendicitis and had your appendix removed. And, um, you know, and if it wasn't for the development in technology there, you know, the chances are that we'd be dead at this point. Um, you know, if, if 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 we survived back in medieval England, uh, or, or or you know medieval Britain to be specific, you know we'd be you know we'd be most of us would probably be dead. Like like what's interesting is that you know the 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 appeal to the old ways as an argument is kind of fallacious in the fact that uh, we have a great deal of survivor bias. It's like 
well, we're here now, therefore what we've always done must have been good. And that's not necessarily and inherently the case because, um, you know, like I say, in, in most other historical contexts, uh, if it wasn't for the appendicectomy that I had, then I'd probably, I probably I would have died in my teenage years. So, <laughs> And it's a very simple and straightforward operation that has no, um, you know, it has, it has no impact on your life beyond the healing process of that particular operation. But, um, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's so so it's it's a complicated argument when we come to talk about our reliance on technology because you know I certainly have I'm certainly reliant you're certainly reliant and um and, and also technology I mean what is and isn't technology I mean a book is technology fire is technology so again we it's a, it's a very broad term and I don't want to necessarily over romanticize the old ways um, as it's so easy to do especially the older you get but. Uh, and maybe this is old man Chris talking, but um, but to become as reliant as we have on this incredibly convenient repository of uh, information and, and this set of tools that we've got, uh, it doesn't necessarily strike me as being a particularly healthy way to live, all things considered. Um, you know, we, we ha but then, you know, but that's just me. That's just me. Maybe that's a video for another time. But uh, anyway, uh, all things considered, uh, I do have to say that, yeah, you know, even though I support Linux first as a platform, uh, gaming is great on it. And no matter what happens to the gaming situation, I, uh, I I'm not going back to Windows. I have no interest in going back to Windows. If I'm ever in a position where I have to go back to Windows, then I, I probably just lose interest in tech, you know, in that kind of desktop computing technology in a broader capacity um, and I'd probably find something else to be interested in flags or you know heraldic shields man there are some great heraldic shields there's a heraldic shield with a turnip on it there's a whole story behind it it's been wonderful so anyway <laughs> um so and I remember before GOG before Steam even was thinking about coming to Linux the, the most of the games that I played were available in the distribution repositories. Uh, we're talking about like, well, I actually have a playlist of open source games on this channel when I took a look at them and I really enjoy them. They're not complicated. They're not fancy. They're not triple A titles, but they're made with love and by a community with a genuine enthusiasm for what they're creating completely, uh, you know, beyond the financial gain because it's, you know, free and open source technology. It's not like, you know, it, it, it's not like they're going to get rich off of making an open source game. But so it, so it is a game made in, entirely out of a sincere love for the craft. And to me, that that speaks to me on, on in in such subtle ways and on such a uh, a meaningful level. Uh, and I'll, I'll be more than happy if I spend the rest of my days playing open source games. And I know that that is not something that is particularly. It's not a particular particularly popular opinion. I think most people de de tend to prefer, you know, the shiny, dazzly games and uh, 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 and and you know the high fidelity graphics and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, that stuff is kind of fun, but. You know, when I play open source games, I get a sense of enjoyment that I feel is uh, that, that is unreplicable by by the more commercial titles, and that's just how I feel about it. But it's you know, it's it's an example of a community coming together and and making something that they genuinely want, uh, and 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 it's a project that they they sincerely care about, and that's you know obvious, and it's seen in small meaningful ways throughout the process and throughout the game itself uh, and I um, uh, you know I, I, and I find that overwhelmingly meaningful I guess really like re you know re really meaningful um, uh, and, it, and it just sort of gives me a very difficult to describe sense of why I choose Linux and why I have a preference for open source. I'm not an open source purist. I think that there are definitely, you know, like I run the NVIDIA drivers. Uh, this channel has a Discord and um, and all of that kind of stuff. So it's it's not like I'm all open source all the time. But I definitely 100% appreciate that it is something that I would like to see us, you know, work more to, towards and that, that it definitely has huge and overwhelming merits on a on on a on a deeply integral level, I guess you know, in terms of how you know our infrastructure is put together, in how 
our systems work and you know this is stuff that most people don't know about least of all care about uh, rightly or wrongly and I think this is why that Linux is unlikely GNU slash Linux the desktop Linux the Manjaro's the you know the the fedoras the arches even the ubuntu's they're not going to go mainstream when such an important part to so many people in the community is the meaningful integrity of the technology itself um that's not a selling point to to most people um most of the time most people look at technology uh, the same way that they look at doing their taxes as something that's an absolute chore to get your head around. They just want it to work. They just want it to, to happen, you know. And and I do my own taxes. I know that it's a, a heck of a chore. So, you know, if, you know, and, and I, I, I plenty, you know, I, I, I see regularly people look at technology and approach technology with that same level of disdain. And it's, you know, so as so I, I personally would like to see Linux get to a point where Maybe it's a ten percent market share. It's that's a bit of an arbitrary number, but it's an it's enough that we're factored into these equations, but not so much that um, that that we have to like make people care. I don't think that's the way that we do it. Um, and you know, uh, the thing is, I know that there are going to be some people that say that well, Linux kind of is a, a, a user friendly and available. You know, it's suitable for just about everyone. Uh, look at Linux Mint. Hell, look at Ubuntu Mate. Look at uh, look at Elementary. Uh, you know, there are some great user friendly Linux distributions out there, and that is true. Like they're great. They are great distributions. But when they go wrong you most of the time still end up in the command line and that's horrifying to people who are not familiar with it and i think that you know that's something that 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 that, that is something that i don't even think can be solved because if we de demand the diversity of user interfaces of the toolkits that those user interfaces are built from or, you know all these desktop environments you know we want a system that's customized to our workflow our use case it is going to be impossible to have that common UI tell people to click on this, click on that, click on this. Uh, the command line is a great way of making Linux distributions a lot more universal so that you don't have to worry about the more superficial level components. But at the end of the day, that's also going to be horrifying to people who don't care for computers. Now, that being said, maybe there is a space in this world for both maybe there is a potential for an open source operating system that is uh, every bit as gui focused and as uniform as what windows aims to be um maybe it could be ba built using the linux kernel and maybe android is a very good example of what that might look like but i find android to be something that I don't want anything to do with. I consider it to be as problematic as Windows, if not more so. Um, we talk about privacy a lot on this channel. But to be honest, the second you buy a smartphone, you, you've lost that battle, I think. And you could talk about the Librem 5, and the Librem 5 certainly does look promising, but it's an expensive piece of kit. I'm not going to be able to afford it. Uh, and also, like, it's still really not that private. Most people, I suspect, will have it connected to the internet 24-7. Um, and it might not necessarily have the GPS, but it will, ha you know, the, the amount of information that it gives, uh, you combine it with the registration with cell phone uh, towers versus uh, some of the, you know, the HTTP information that gets sent across it, all that kind of stuff. You can piece together so, so much. Um, there was a piece of software that I saw on GitHub that actually managed to work out if someone was lying down, sitting up, or standing up, based on how their how the angle of their f smartphone is tilted. Uh, I saw a piece of um, software on GitHub that managed to work out someone else's sleeping pattern just from uh, their Facebook activity, and this was from all publicly available information on their Facebook page as well. Like the amount of information that we just give off uh, in our day-to-day -day use of the internet especially on smartphones is overwhelming and we don't even think about it we think that you know w w we put our, our fancy you know uh, browser extensions on and we might even use a vpn but i was looking at some of my fingerprinting statistics on my browser and it's so easy to fingerprint based on uh extensions that are installed like my browser has a unique identifying setup 
that um, despite the amount of VPNs that I use or, or any of that kind of stuff, I can still very easily arbitrarily be tracked. Um, the only thing that I think can even curtail it a little bit is turning off JavaScript. And we all know how horrendously uh, overladen the uh, web is with JavaScript these days. I think if we genuinely want privacy, we have to make uh, a Java, you know, a JavaScript. We have to make surfing the internet JavaScript free by default, and that's just not going to happen. If we want privacy, that's where it's going to have to start. Is that we're going to have to start turning off Java, and even then, even then, it's probably a battle still lost. Anyway, sorry, it didn't mean to be depressing. This video was supposed to be up deep. I promise. This was this was supposed to be like how great gaming is on Linux. It is. We, I, I genuinely do think that we've lost the privacy battle when it comes to online. Like, and and I think that that's that's a completely thrown battle if we even bring phones into the mix here as well. And don't get me wrong, I've got the thirty three ten. Right, that still connects to, to mobile phone masts. Yes, you can take the battery out, and then I believe that, that makes you, you know, brings you into a state of privacy. But uh, I've never done that. I mean. <laughs> I sometimes leave my phone at home when I go when I go out of the house. Um, I like the idea that there are times in my day when I can't be contacted. Like to me, I, that is a that's a nice relieving feeling. That if I even if I just go to the bank to do some business, I just leave the phone at home. It, it's 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 really kind of refreshing. Whoever th that's a really weird thing to say, isn't it? That it, you actually like take a break from people being able to contact you at any given time during the day by going to the bank. But, you know, and I'm one of those people that goes to the bank in person as well. Uh, because I do, I manage some finances for some from, for some local groups and um, w these things just work better in person. They know who I am down there and you can ask, you know, it's just nicer that way. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, I'm old school. Old man Chris is back at it again. Uh, anyway, man, I've completely curtailed myself now. Um, yada yada yada, yeah, but open source games, I love them, they mean, they mean the world to me, and I know that it sounds so silly to say that, and you guys can make fun of me all, all you want, um, because it's, it means more to me than the glitz and the dazzle of, of anything close to the AAA, or even like the, the, the tiers below that, um, but it's, you know, and, and I don't think that that's popular, it's not popular, I know it's not popular, I regularly get told it's not popular, uh, so, you know, and, and maybe that's okay, but, you know, and, and maybe Linux might break through in a different way when it comes to, if, if it, you know, or, or an open source operating system might break out in a different way. Um, I don't know if you want to call Android an open source operating system. There are plenty of parts of it that are not, but there are still stock Android builds that are open source only, I believe, um, or certainly close to it. But then you still have to use the Play Store, for the most part, and uh, and and there are many many applications that require on the Play services. So there, you know, that's almost like the embrace uh, the uh, embrace extend extinguish philosophy of of Google, uh, originally of course crafted by Microsoft in Play here. So uh, a little bit disappointing in in, in that regard. Um, but uh, but with F Droid, you know, there's progress being made in that regard. But and I like F Droid as well. When I was uh, using my mobile phone, I did have F Droid uh, as as my like sole uh, distribution platform for apps, and and that was great. Um, but there were a number of apps that that just relied on on Google Play services. I was glad to see the back of them, to be honest. Um, but um, but that was definitely not. To protect my privacy, that was to support open source projects, and that's a whole different. Uh, th you know, there's those are two things now. But anyway, those those are just my thoughts on it. I guess um, open source gaming, love it. Um, GOG, as uh, you know, they're not exactly super Linux friendly, but most of their stuff runs really easily on Wine using Play on Linux or Lutris or just L, just just vanilla Wine install. Uh, it d tends to work pretty well in that regard. Um, Steam and Valve continue to do great stuff for Linux, even though, you know, and, and I, I mean, I say even though they don't have to, uh, Valve know that Microsoft are going to try everything in their power to close uh, other non-Microsoft stores. But Microsoft want to turn Windows into Android for desktop. And, they, you know, they want to use the Windows Store for everything. And I know that there are laws in place I believe they're European Union laws uh, that actually limit 
uh, how closed an operating system can be. Um, and I do know that there were some things that came into play when Google, when some Google phones or some Android phones tried to make it so that you couldn't install um, extra packages outside the Google Play Store. And I believe that there was some ruling on that. I, my memory is a little bit hazy on that. I think that was uh, the, the European Union that ruled on that. And the similar um, rule, of course, would apply to um, for, for the Windows environment as well. Uh, and an interesting thing that I found out about the original Xbox, the very first Xbox that came out, uh, was that it, for tax purposes, was classified as a PC, not a games console. And there's actually a very distinct legal difference behind it. And with the original Xbox, uh, you were, I believe, able to install Linux on it. And they did actually make it so that, that was possible um, as distinct proof that it's a computer not a games console i think i believe since then things have changed but it was a very interesting bit of trivia that i uh, i picked up the other day which was uh, which was quite amusing uh interesting of course actually talking a little bit about games consoles is of course the nintendo nes mini and the nintendo snes uh use linux based uh, operating systems uh, GNU slash Linux based operating systems, if I'm not entirely mistaken, to run those games on. And I think that's actually kind of an interesting idea, the idea of just have, buying a box that you just plug into your TV and it has all the games on it uh, and you get 30 games and, you know, it's a, it's really as simple as that. Uh, and so, you know, to say that Linux is, 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 is outside of the mainstream at this point, Actually, I don't know if you'd call the NES Mini and the SNES Mini mainstream. Probably not. But you know, like Nintendo have a Linux have Linux based games consoles. Android gaming is, of course, based on Linux. So it's not like there haven't been some breakthroughs into the mainstream market. Many of which have have been successful, um, either in good ways or bad. But um, you know, all of these things much more complicated than um, than just you know winning an outright battle here. And and whether or not. Uh, market share is something that we should be concerned about. Uh, I enjoyed Linux back when it was uh, had had a much l uh, lesser market share than it does today, despite the fact that even today it doesn't have a particularly large one. Because Linux serves a certain mindset, uh, a certain mindset of of uh, uh, I don't even know, um, and that's not to you know I, I don't want to cast any generalizations on Windows users. It's the default. It, it's you know it, it, everyone you know all kinds of people use Windows at the end of the day, but um, but I think Linux is, you know, it, it's almost niche by design, isn't it? Anyway, guys, I think I'm going to leave it there. Nice little ramble, I thought, and um, I'll just share my thoughts on, on the state of Linux gaming. Um, for those of you that are interested in... I always save this to the end of the video. I go, well, look, if you guys like my long rambly videos, uh, I do release these as an MP3 over on my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Chris Ware. Don't worry, it's not behind a paywall. It's just Patreon is a great place to put up uh, MP3 content. So uh, if you do ever see a long rambly video at any point uh, that you think, oh, well, I'll put this on the, on MP3 on my commute to work or something, then uh, just download it from, from the Patreon and... Uh, and it's available there. Also, if you're in the Riot or Discord room, uh, the MP3 for this also gets posted in there as well. But it tends to go up the chat pretty quickly. But there we go. Um, so anyway, guys, thank you very much for joining me. That's about it from me today. And until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome, and so has gaming on Linux. Excellent. Okay, toodaloo. <laughs>